How late is too late to launch a new career? In this video, author Amy Popel talks about publishing her first book at age 50 and how her newest novel, The Sweet Spot, comedically celebrates all the women who take control of the twists, turns, thrills, and spills of life. Hello, it's Angie from AGC Books, where we talk with authors about their latest titles. Make sure to click the subscribe button to see all of our latest conversations and stick around to find out how Amy Popel managed to find humor even in one of the saddest chapters of her life. Amy Popel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I have to say, when I finished this book, I was so sad because I had to say goodbye to the characters. I love hearing that from readers. It's one of my favorite things that people tell me um, is that they feel like they've made friends when they read the book and also that they're sad to say goodbye to the house that's in the book. Yeah, yeah. The people and the place. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're such well-developed characters. I just felt, I, I just wanted to know more about what happens next with them. Yep. And do any of your characters ever come back or have you ever considered, I mean, will we get to see Melinda ever again? I, d I always think about that. I love books with sequels. I just read Andrew Sean Greer's sequel to his first book, Less. If you haven't read that one, it's fabulous. And then he just wrote a new one called Less is Lost. And when I read that, I thought, oh, maybe a sequel would be a good idea, but I don't have anything in the works right now. Okay, so we can keep our fingers yes, crossed, Yes, definitely. Well, I have to say, as as a mother, the the comedic chaos that happens in Lauren and Leo's home, it just, it, in ways, it makes you feel better because sometimes you're like, well, yes. at least it's not that bad. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right? I, I wanted to give that couple a beautiful place to live. And I love the brownstones in Greenwich Village. That's my neighborhood. I walk by those beautiful brownstones all the time, and I just wonder, like, what's happening in there? But when I decided to give this couple and their three children a brownstone to live in, I didn't want their life to be too easy. So I decided to make it an unrenovated brownstone. I decided to give them the worst appliances ever, a mouse up on the third floor. I just <laughs> wanted their life to not be too easy. Yeah, well, you did a good job of that. I, yes, <laughs> yes. Add a totally rambunctious dog. Right. Um, add a grandmother who comes for a hot minute, but then just never leaves. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of what I, I just, I think theatrically when I'm writing, so it, for me it's like a it's like a set, it's sort of like a Broadway set, and I just think, who do I need to bring on stage and off stage? That's the way my brain works. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense because when you read it, you feel like you're watching a play or watching a movie. Like I could totally see it playing out. Yes, I have a little background in theater. Really, I never made much of it. I found out that I had a very narrow range <laughs> in my acting abilities. I was living in Boston at the time, but I'm a Southerner, so if there was a Southern comedy, if there was an audition for that, that part was mine. I was gonna get that role. Anything else, not so much. I, I had a hard time, I just didn't have breadth in my acting skills. But I read plays all the time, and I did enough theater that I just love it, and that's just, in fact, my first book I wrote as a play and then I turned it into a novel. Oh, really? Well, yes. So that's interesting. You came to writing. Yeah. Your first book was published when you were 50? 50 years old. Yeah, this is a brand new career for me. But what's great is, I mean, you have all, you have incredible life experiences that you can use, yes. right? Yes, yes. I tell people all the time, whenever somebody says at an event, I'm thinking of writing a book, is it too late? I think quite the opposite for writing. I think the more, crazy jobs you've had, funny people you've met, interesting experiences you've had, weird places that you've moved to, any of that just adds to the well you can draw from when it comes to writing. So to me, all the things I did before, acting, that worked its way into my second book, teaching high school English has worked its way into my books, you know, working in schools, um, raising kids, all of that living in different places, all of that finds, that material finds its way into my books. And you worked in a private school, right? I did. In admissions? I, I did. I worked in New York City in a private school. Um, I worked with kids applying to 5 through 12. Okay. And it was just a really delightful career. It helped me for writing for a couple of reasons. And one was that I just met so many fascinating people in that job. I can imagine, job. yeah. And the children were so funny. They're so, to interview a kid applying to fifth or sixth grade, they are sometimes so scripted and they know just the right thing to say. 
And other times they say the one thing their parents told them not to say, and they'll <laughs> they'll actually say, now my mom told me not to tell you this, <laughs> right? but, and it's just so funny. Um, and the other thing that was useful about that job was that every day I would interview a child, parents, a child, the parents. At the end of the day, I had to write it up. Who was this person? Who did I just spend 30 minutes with? And then the parents, what were they like? The idea being that three months later, somebody who never met these people would open the folder, read my write-up, and get a good sense for who those people were. And that turned out to be the best writing exercise in the world because I really had to think about my audience, who's you know the person who's gonna read this later. It's not just for me, it's for someone else. Mm -hmm. What words do I need to use? What quotes that the child said should really make their way into this? Um, what do I need to leave out because I don't want to mislead anybody? So it was it was a really fascinating writing exercise that I think just helped me. <laughs> it really helped me a lot. Let's talk more about the sweet spot. So for this book, for for people who haven't read it yet, yes, can you just give a quick little description of how how the book reads? It features three women of very different ages who don't know each other at all at the outset of the book, but very quickly come to find that they have every reason in the world to despise each other, and ultimately have to sort of come together when a child that is, does not belong to any of them ends up in their care. And it's um, a comedy, for sure. I love reading all kinds of books. I love mysteries, I love sad books. But what I bring to fiction, or what I try to bring to fiction is humor. So it's definitely a comedic look at a family in a big falling apart house right. and the neighbors and how their different stories all come together. Can we talk a little bit about Melinda? Yes. So I ha I, as I was reading it, I thought, oh my goodness, she must have been so fun to write. So Melinda's oh a gosh. scorned woman yes. and she does basically everything that any scorned woman probably has wanted to do. Yes. She does it. And she actually does it. Yeah. Melinda's my age. And at this point, I have so many dear, wonderful friends. We've all been through a lot of things. We've all been through a lot of challenges, wonderful experiences, just different kinds of hardships. And one thing I've been noticing in myself and in them is how much rage we have. <laughs> and I think rage is really fun to write about and fun to read about, because like you said, some people might want to do some of the things Melinda does, but we get to just watch her do it because yes. we don't actually want to act that way. I really wanted to give this scorned character a chance to pull herself together, to regroup, to realize that maybe the rage and revenge aren't helping, aren't, maybe aren't making her feel any better. And although her ex-husband may deserve it, spending all of her energy on that isn't helping her. Mm -hmm. And I just loved giving her a new story and some hope for her future and not changing. I never like my characters to change personalities, but I do like them to come out in a better, hopefully happier place. So where did this idea come from? Where did this, how did this begin? So it really did begin with Melinda. It really did begin with my own feeling of Reaching my age and realizing how good women are at so many things and how much how strong women are and how able women are to reinvent themselves, sometimes in the face of hardship and sometimes just because of life circumstances. And I'm sort of endlessly fascinated by that. And I just sort of want to pat women on the back for their, you know, you suddenly you become a mother and everything changes. Mm -hmm. And you have to adapt to that. And I'm just sort of blown away with how well women do that. Yeah. That's kind of where the book actually started. Yeah. And I, so I gave these women each changed circumstances. And then I got to sort of play out how would they react to that. The men in the book, there's, <laughs> there's some interesting men in the book. But the father figures do come out in this as well. Yes. And I wondered, I know your book is dedicated to, to your parents and their yes. memories. Yes, yes. And at the end, you mentioned that you wish your dad could have read I it. I do, yeah. He was your biggest fan. He was. Yeah, and speaking of, the thing that I always try to do, which is find humor in heartbreak, mm -hmm. um, which is something that I try to do in my life all the time. No matter what happens, I try to find some way of seeing the absurdity in it. Um, I wrote some of this book when my dad was in hospice, like just sitting next to him. Like I was sort of working and, and my sisters and I would find things that 
were just absurd and hilarious in our moments. And it's never to undermine the difficulty. But I can't help but feel that in the same way that revenge might not make you feel better, when does laughter not make you feel better? Laughter is good for us. I just think it's healthy. So if there's ever a moment where I can somehow find the joy or humor, even in the heartache, I, that's what I strive to do for myself and that's what I try to bring to my books. But yes, my, my dad was my biggest fan and he would have loved this one. Let's talk a little bit about your writing process. So I've read that you do not outline. You're not an outline lining kind of author. Is that true? It is true. So I taught high school English for years and I really emphasized how important it is to structure your ideas. And I think for any kind of academic writing, that's really important. I don't want to say that there's no method to it because I do I do, I do so many drafts. You cannot imagine how much rewriting I do. There's just so much editing. Like I always say to people, if they say I'm afraid to write that first chapter because it's going to be bad, and I'm like, yes, yes, it is going to be bad, and that's okay. It's going to actually be terrible. <laughs> Don't, but you can't edit until you have something on the page. You have to get it down first, and then you can make it better, and then you can do it again and make it a little bit better. And it's going to be 12 times, maybe more, before you're finished. I focus so much on the characters and the way I get to know the characters is by writing about them and then I get to know them better and then I suddenly think oh wait that thing that she said in chapter one she wouldn't say that she would say this or that choice that this character makes in the third chapter he wouldn't make that choice this is what he would do so I continually go back to the beginning so I might have sort of a premise a concept and I think all outliners will tell you that they rewrite, they adjust their outlines. So it's not as though anyone, I think, just outlines a book and then just writes to the outline. If the outline's failing you, you have to tweak it. And I think when you notice that you're trying to push the character to do something just so that you can get to point B, maybe point B isn't where they, maybe you need to rethink point B. And it's so much work when you have to do that. Like I, I, I sometimes, like I have had days where I've realized I had to rewrite, like in the case of this book, I pretty much started over again after oh no. I'd basically finished the book. And in that case, it wasn't a character choice situation. It was that I realized that I had not found the best perspective to tell the story from. Really? And I sort of stuck to it. And that's why I, I, I you know, I think it's important to always keep open-minded. I just sort of decided that this was the way I wanted to tell the story. Can you tell us what, it, what it, how I, it was? I wrote the entire book first person from Evelyn's perspective. So the oh. grandmother in the story. I had this idea that I wanted her sort of a little bit back and to have the three women, Olivia, Lauren, and Melinda, have their drama. And I wanted Evelyn sort of sitting back and watching it all and bringing her perspective to it all. To, do, to give her that responsibility for the entire book, it was just too much to put on her and I was very limited, and it's such a big role to be a first-person narrator that you're carrying, that, that character carries the entire story, and to justify her existence as my narrator, I kept writing her backstory into the book, and more backstory, and more backstory, and then at one point, I just sent her off on a trip. She went off and she visited her, she went to visit her daughter-in-law in Boston, and off she went, and she just abandoned the three women in the city. And I ended up sort of with two books that didn't make sense together, so I started over. Um, I don't consider that a waste of time. It's not efficient, as I said, but I never considered that a waste of time because all that work was still getting to know the characters. So when it came to writing Evelyn's one chapter in third person, <laughs> not in first person, I knew her so well that it was it was a, just a joy to write her chapter because I just knew what she would do. Oh, that's such a change. Yeah. But I like it because then because she would have never known what Melinda was thinking or what exactly. Yeah. And when I decided um, that it, that it was wrong that I had made a mistake, it was like just the it was the most freeing thing in the world because yeah. all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, 
I get to hear what Leo thinks and yeah. I get to hear what Melinda thinks. And yeah. I like to do, I said I don't outline, but I do like to do some kind of pattern with my chapters, like in musical chairs, because it's a book about classical music. No reader would ever notice this. This is sort of a thing I do for myself. I wrote the whole book in like a waltz, like so sets of three chapters. Um, where my main character Bridget gets a chapter, my main character Will gets a chapter, and then because it's musical chairs, I have an empty seat, an empty spot. And I filled that empty spot with a different character in each round. So it was that kind of a pattern, if it can work. And again, if it doesn't work, I have to throw it out, come up with something new. But if it works, I like having that kind of internal structure for myself. Yeah. Um, and also it makes sure that you're hearing from everybody in kind of a balanced way. I love that you were willing to to fail in both situations. You're like, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, but I like yeah. that you didn't get all wrapped up in it. I did for like two days. <laughs> I went to bed and just mourned the idea of this. You know, they could talk about kill your darlings. Like I killed yeah. every single one of them. Yeah. Um, that is not. That's not my favorite day for sure. But you have to do what's right for the story you're trying to tell. And if that meant starting over, I had to start over. And none of this was supposed to be happening anyway. I mean, I, I'm still sort of stunned that I'm writing books anyway. So I feel like it's not a race. And I feel as though I'm willing to take the time that it needs to take to get it right. Yeah. It's definitely discouraging when you realize that something's not working. And in fact, I think it's kind of hilarious that I, <laughs> that I had to scrap 110,000 words and start from scratch. Oh and yes, I see the absurdity in that and I see the humor in it and I also see that forcing a book that's not working, it's not there's no joy in that. It's just it's what do they say? It's a square peg in a round hole. You're just trying to make something happen that's not going to work. So generally speaking, how long does it take you to write a book? One one that you keep. One that I keep. <laughs> I'm not a book a year person. I'm envious of people who are, and I'm sort of just awed by people who can write a book a year. I think it's amazing. I'm just not that efficient. I'm more like 18 months to two years. Um, and I write very much in sessions. Like I'll have like three months where it's just kind of all that I do. And I, I, I stop exercising. <laughs> I put a lot of the things that I should be doing to the side. Um, and I just focus on that. Binge writing, isn't that what you guys binge writing. use? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm a binge writer. I can't, I'm not, I would love to be sort of a nine to five writer where like I wake up and I exercise and then I sit at my desk. But what my husband will note is like first thing in the morning when I'm in one of these little modes, I've got my laptop. What did I do last night? Where did I, and, and he'll get off and go to work and leave and come back six hours later and I'm still in my pajamas. So bad for the posture. Oh right. my gosh. Like I'm just hunched over and he'll say, didn't you get up? Did you do anything? And I'm, I just, I didn't. You're like, yes, look at but my I'm computer. Like, yes. I, <laughs> I'm like, it, less do you think I didn't accomplish anything today? Um, I did. It doesn't, it's not attractive and it's not um, especially healthy maybe but I again it's the way it's just how I do the, things yeah the glamorous world of writers right very <laughs> glamorous yes in my pajamas it's it's definitely not especially glamorous but yeah oh my goodness people if they want to laugh watch your book trailers those are hilarious those are fun to make so every writer always wonders about marketing how should I market my book and should I get on TikTok and dance and like no no <laughs> Hard Definitely pass. hard pass, <laughs> not going to happen. So I thought, what can I do? So for three of my four books, I've made book trailers. And instead of doing what some people do, which is just sort of music in the background and some quotes about the book or whatever, I try to think of a scene that I can write that has something to do with the book but isn't in the book. Mm -hmm. So something that would tell you a bit about the story and give you a sense of the tone of the story, mm -hmm. but not something that takes place in the story. So I write those and then I 
rope in whatever family members I can get to participate. And they're all on my website. If and you watch them, you'll notice the recurring characters. Yes. You'll be like, wait a minute, that, that yes, dog exactly. is it. <laughs> exactly, yes, my dog has had starring roles in two of them. Yes. Yeah. This has been so much fun. Oh, thank, thank you, Amy. No, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. Do Amy Popel and me a favor, give this video a thumbs up. And keep an eye out for my next interview with the incomparable Sally Hepworth about her domestic thriller, The Soulmate. Get notified when that conversation comes out by clicking subscribe.